Uh, speaking of the Word of God, I want you to grab your copy. Would you do that? You either have a hard copy or you have a phone or a tablet. I want you to find Joshua chapter 3. Uh, Joshua chapter 3, that is the passage that Brother Joe read for us just a few minutes ago. I uh, appreciate uh, Pastor Ethan uh, preaching last Sunday, and we had a little bit of a break from the book of Joshua. Now we get back uh, to uh, Joshua chapter 3, if you're a guest. Uh, we believe in just expository preaching, preaching through the Bible, and we find ourselves now in an Old Testament book. Uh, the book of Joshua, as God's people move in, in their conquest of the land. Today, I have entitled the message, The God of Complexity. The God of Complexity. Has anybody noticed that we are living in some very complex days? Has anybody noticed that the world is very complex? There are a lot of things going on right now. Uh, a lot of situations, a lot of issues, that the resolution to that seemed to be very complex. There are people in our church, I've been on the phone this week, I've had counseling sessions this week with some folks in our church uh, being very honest with you. Uh, some of us are dealing with some very complex issues in life, complex issues in our families. Uh, there are complex issues related to our work, our occupation. There's some complex issues as it relates to maybe a child or a grandchild, a son or a daughter, uh, that if you could, you would fix the situation. But yet you know it's too complex. It's too big for you to fix. Can anybody relate to what I'm saying this morning? Complexity. Life is complex. And I feel like God, in my heart, sent me to the pulpit today to remind you that the God of the Bible, the God of the Old Testament, your God, the God that you serve, the God you believe in, He is the God of complexity. That when life is complex, when life is challenging, when life is difficult, God is there, and he's still God in the complexity. I confess to you that the Christian life at times is complex. How about this? Pastoring is complex. It's challenging. You may not know this. This is not in my notes, but I'm going to say it anyway. There are many people that have deemed 2022 to be the year of the resignation. The year of the resignation where pastors are going to leave the ministry because we live in some complex times. What do we do when we find ourselves in the midst of complexity? One of the things I love about the Bible, reading through the Old Testament, is I see a whole lot of complexity. The book of Joshua begins, of course, after the death of Moses. Moses is mentioned a whole bunch of times in the first chapter. And so I think about the life of Moses, and I think about the complexity that he faced. God comes to Moses, and he says, Moses, I want you to go and stand in front of the most powerful man in Egypt, and I want you to tell him to let my people go. How many of you can feel a little complexity in that moment? How am I going to do this? How about this? What am I going to say? What made the issue even more complex for Moses was Moses did not speak well. He uh, had a speech impediment. And so he begins to bargain with God. And, and he says, God, you know, of all people, why would you ask me? Are you sure there's not somebody else that could do this job? And God says, no, Moses, you're the man. You're the one. I want you to go and speak to Pharaoh. In Joshua chapter 3, we find a great complexity for both Joshua the leader and for the people of God. The end of chapter 2, we received the scouting report from the two spies that Joshua sent in who, of course, encountered Rahab and they slipped out of the city and made their way back to the camp. And they informed Joshua, Joshua, 
uh, this town, the city of Jericho, it's ready. It's prime for the picking. Uh, we're going to take this land. Joshua, the, the Amorites, the citizens of Jericho, they are scared to death. They are fearful because they've heard about all the mighty acts of God, the mighty miracles that God has performed. Jericho is scared. It's time to move in. The people of God had the promises of God. God had promised them the land. He promised them this place that was flowing with milk and honey, a wonderful place to live. They had the promise of God. It was their land, and they were going to occupy it. They were promised the presence of God over and over in Joshua's life and ministry, and, and even throughout the Old Testament, you see the very clear promise of God that I'll be with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. They had the promise of victory. No one will stand in your way. No army will defeat you. You are going to win the battle. We don't start the battle until Joshua chapter 6 at the uh, walls of Jericho falling down. And so what we find in Joshua chapter 3, 4, and 5 are three chapters of preparation. Preparation. As they're getting ready to go into the land. And right off the bat... We have a very complex issue where the people needed God to show up and to show out in a big way. I was reading a story the other day about uh, some college students in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. On a Saturday night, uh, they were having intramural football at 8 o'clock. Uh, they had a game they were going to play on the fields there of the college. And so one of the guys on one of the intramural teams uh, just went out on Twitter and he tweeted at Kevin Durant, who at that time played for the Oklahoma City Thunder. Now, how many of you out here have no idea who Kevin Durant is? Go ahead and raise your hand. I knew it probably be about 80% of you. He is about 6 foot 10, 240 pounds. He's worth about $175 million. And uh, he's one of the best players in the NBA. At that time, he's on the Oklahoma City Thunder. So this college kid tweets out, Hey, KD, that's short for Kevin Durant. Hey, KD, why don't you come to the intramural game tonight and play quarterback for us? Well, he hits in, sends the tweet out in Twitter world, goes about his day, gets to the intramural game that night. They're all there ready to play the game, and they looked up, and here comes Kevin Durant in his sweatpants. He actually, show, I mean, this kid thought he would never read that tweet. He would never show up. Kevin Durant shows up and he plays quarterback for that intramural team. Now get this, they were so excited about him being here, they forfeited the game so he could play on their team. And uh, he was their quarterback that night. I read that story the other day and I thought about maybe our Christian life sometimes. We throw out a prayer for God to show up, but really down deep, we don't know if he will and truthfully, in moments of a lack of faith, we think he's probably not going to. That it's not going to go our way. But oh, how many times in my Christian journey these years have I seen God show up when I didn't expect him to show up? When I've seen God show out in a magnificent way when I didn't fully expect him to show up. There have been moments in my life when I have thought, I don't see a path ahead. I don't see how this is going to work out. And then God worked it all out. Is there anybody in the room that can say amen right there? Joshua finds himself in a complex situation. What is the situation? I'm glad that you asked. A couple of weeks ago, I showed you this little map, and I want to show it to you again uh, just for a picture in your mind, the scripture says that the people are gathered over here on the east side of the Jordan River at Shittim. They gathered up, and the first city they're going to conquer is Jericho in Jericho chapter 6. But as the people are gathered over here on the east side, there is something in their way. And there's something that Joshua has to lead the people through. Joshua has to get one million people from this side of the Jordan River over to the west side of the Jordan River. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had to do that, I'd be a little nervous. 
And I'd be asking, how is this going to work out? At the same time, I'd like to think that maybe I could have the kind of faith that Joshua had. Now, he didn't know all the details, but he knew that God was going to work it out. One of the beautiful things about leadership, even as a pastor, is to know that I don't have to have all the answers, and I don't have to have it all figured out. I'm reminded of the general that I read about in the Pentagon who had a sight on his desk that said, the high level of my job requires that I not know what I'm doing. Some of you will get that about Tuesday. <laughs> that I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how it's going to work out. I don't know how we're going to pull this off. I don't know how. I don't know how we're going to get a million people to the other side, but I'm just going to follow God and allow him to lead the way. I was reading the other day a quote by Ronald Heifetz. Look on the screen. It's not Bible. It's not inspired, but it made me think about leadership, and it made me think about this moment for, uh, for Joshua. Heifetz said this. He said, adaptive processes don't require leadership with answers. It requires leadership that creates structures that hold people together through the very conflictive, passionate, and sometimes awful process of addressing questions for which there aren't easy answers. Man, I love that. Here's Joshua. Uh, Joshua is the leader. He needs to have some answers. He needs to have some direction. But his number one priority in this moment, as Heifetz says, is to keep everybody together and to keep everybody focused on the main thing. What is the main thing? It is their covenantal relationship with God. It is his promise. It is his blessings. And as they work through some of these conflicting issues, and, and no doubt people had opinions about whether we should or we shouldn't, and Joshua finds himself with no easy answers, yet he knows that God is going to work it all out. I'm sure there's somebody, after reading through the history of the children of Israel and how they at times got carnal and fleshly and they attacked Moses and criticized leadership, I'm sure there's somebody that tapped Joshua on the shoulder and said, you think you're going to lead us over there? Or somebody said to Joshua, Joshua, how are we going to do this? And Joshua maybe said, you know, right now I, I don't have an answer, but I know the one who does. I know the one who does. I'm looking at the Jordan River, and it's overflowing. We'll see that in just a minute in the text. It's overflowing. I know we're supposed to be over there, and I don't know how we're going to get over there, but I know the one who will get us over there, so I'm just going to follow him one step at a time. Do you ever find yourself standing at the Jordan River, and you don't know what you're going to do? Do you have something going on today that's so complex? So complex, you're dreading Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday this week because you don't know what you're going to do and you don't know how it's going to work out. I promise you there's a whole bunch of people in this room like that right now because I know as the pastor, you've got a complex situation. What are we going to do? What's going to happen? I think Joshua chapter 3 gives us three important things about the God of complexity and about our relationship to him when we find ourselves in those moments. I hope you'll write them down. Number one, when you find yourself in complexity, just do the next right thing. Just do the next right thing. Now, we like to have plans, right? We want to know, how's it all going to work out? Some of you in this room, your gift is planning. And man, you can plan an event, and you can lay it all out, and you're a detailed person, an administrative person, and you can just, I mean, you can see the big picture, and you can put something together that we all would be proud of, right? But how about when you have to live your journey one step at a time? You don't know what to do. You don't know what's going to happen. 
So what do we do? We look in front of us and we do the next right thing. In the book, Jordan River Rules, Robert Morgan said this. He said, God leads us in stages and in steps. God leads us in stages and in steps. Man, I don't know about you, but I'm learning this more and more in my Christian life, in my pastoral leadership, to just live an hour and a day at a time. An hour and a day at a time. I don't have to have all the answers for next week or next month or next year because I know who's in control of tomorrow. What I need to do is look right in front of me and do the next right thing. How many of you in your life, you don't have to raise your hand, but as you think about your life and you think about the next right thing, you know that that thing is difficult. You know that it's going to be hard. It's not going to be an easy path. It might be something that you you don't really want to do. You might be like Moses, and you might be saying to God, God, I don't want to do this. God, I'm not the person for this. But yet you know God has called you to do it. What does that look like, Tim? It might be that sometimes this week you need to take a coworker out to lunch and share the gospel with them. It might be that you've got somebody that you have a good relationship with in the workplace and you can talk about sports and the weather and Maybe a little politics every now and then, but you never really got down to the nitty-gritty. And, and, and in your mind, you're thinking, you know, I really like them, and I want them to like me, but I just don't want to tell them they're a sinner that needs a Savior. That can be challenging, can it? But, but it's not, hey, what am I going to do? Am I going to be a missionary? Maybe the next right thing for you is just to share the gospel with a coworker. Maybe the next right thing for you to do in this moment, it it might be something like uh, getting right with a brother or a sister. The next right thing in front of you might be repenting and giving your bitterness to the Lord. Sometimes the things that God calls us to, when we look at them, they are difficult. They are complex. Yet God is calling us to just do the next right thing. Am I speaking to a room of people today that believe God's direction is the right direction? That God's direction is the best direction? So we follow him. It's important in verses 1 through 6 to notice what it looks like to follow him because in verse number 3, we see that the officers move through the camp and this is what they tell the people. As soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priest, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it, in order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priest, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. Now here we see the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Lord, mentioned 17 times in Joshua chapter 3 and chapter 4. You may remember back in our study in the book of Hebrews as we were looking at the Holy of Holies and the mercy seat, I uh, showed you a picture, it'll be up on the screen, a picture of uh, the Ark of the Covenant and how the priests would go in and offer a sacrifice. If you piece together several passages in the scripture, you know that the ark became the representation of the presence of God. 1 Kings chapter 6 says that inside the ark were placed the tablets or the Ten Commandments. As a matter of fact, 1 Kings 6, 8 says uh, that the tablets were the only thing uh, that were inside the ark of the covenant. But over time, uh, we piece together Uh, passages like Hebrews chapter 9 verse number 4 that says there were actually three things inside the ark. There was the tablets of the law, there was uh, the staff or the rod of Aaron the high priest, 
Now, don't get hung up on that. Uh, in some of my reading, you know, there, uh, there's this conversation of how long is that rod and would it have even fit and how tall was Aaron. Uh, don't get hung up on all those details, all right? Uh, just know that your Bible says the rod was inside the ark. The third thing uh, is the golden jar of the manna. The manna that, of course, reminded them of God's blessing to them as they wandered in the wilderness. So three main things about the ark. Again, it represents the powerful presence of God. His holiness in that we are sinful, wicked people, and we have violated the law of God. His holiness, his presence. We come into his presence, he is a holy God. The, the rod represents, of course, uh, the direction or the leadership that the high priest would have given to the people. We see uh, here in the text that the Levitical priests take up the ark, the spiritual leaders of the people lead the people across the Jordan River. And then the manna reminds them that God always provides. God always provides. Now we know the ark of the covenant is the, is the powerful, overwhelming presence of God, so much so that the people were told, you can't even place your hand on the ark. Poor Uzzah. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, as they're carrying the ark and they stumble, he reaches up to catch the ark and he dropped dead because he placed his hand upon the ark. The significance of what Joshua does here with the priest is this, is that they put front and center, they put into place in the lead position of the people the powerful presence of God. Now, we believe theologically in the omnipresence of God Almighty, that God is everywhere. The psalmist said, if I ascend to the hill, you're there. If I'm down in the valley, you're there. If I'm in the depths of the sea, you're there. If I'm on the mountain, you are there. And so we believe that God is everywhere. The people had the promise that he would never leave them or forsake them. I will always be with you. But there is something different about living in the manifest presence of God. Moses, as he's wrestling with God in Exodus chapter 33, God gives him this task of leading the people, and he's struggling with it. And he and God are having a conversation where Moses intercedes for this nation of knuckleheads. In Exodus 33 and verse number 12, Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, God speaking to Moses, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Moses said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. As I read that verse once again this week, to me verse 15 is just kind of holy ground. It's holy ground should be for all of us as Christians, but it's really holy ground for a spiritual leader. It's holy ground for a pastor. As Moses said, God, I'm going to do this. I'm going to lead. But if you don't go with me, I don't want to do this. God, I don't want to go forward. I don't want to go forward another day, another moment. I don't want to take another step unless you go with us, unless your presence is with us. Let me ask you something, Point Church. Should that not be the prayer of every local New Testament church? God, we can't, we can't go another step. We can't, we can't do what we do. Listen, we can have programs and plans and calendars. We can have sermon series. We can have a whole lot of things. We can have good music. We can have a whole lot of things, but if God's presence and his power is not with us, we will fail. 
and ministry will become more and more complex. We will be more overwhelmed by the complexity than we will the awesome presence and power of God if we do not keep first things first. Do the next right thing. Put God in the right place. Notice as David Howard said, that Joshua does not place his army corps of engineers at the front of the pack. But rather he placed the Levitical priests with the Ark of the Covenant to say first things first. This is all about the glory and the power and the presence of God. Now when we think about the presence of God, there's something important about that the uh, passage gives us a detail about, and that is the people are instructed to stand back at least a thousand yards from the ark. Now, obviously, there is the matter of the holiness, don't touch it, don't get too close. But most scholars say that is not the key issue here. The issue here is that there are so many people that need to get to the other side. Obviously, humanly speaking, they all need to be able to see the ark to see which way that it's going. So there needs to be some distance between them and the ark. But, but spiritually speaking, there's another uh, element to this, and that is that God wanted them back far enough away so that they could see the mighty, awesome works of God. He wanted them to have a front row seat to God being at work. He wanted them to see his miraculous power. I love what uh, John Butler said about this. He said, sometimes God lets us get a real good look at our difficulties in order for us to greater appreciate God's work on our behalf in overcoming our difficulties. Some of us here today would say amen to that. I'm getting a real good look at my difficulties. I've got a really good front row seat to my complexities. And here God is saying, step back, step back. I want you to see, I want you to appreciate, I want you to experience my power and my glory. Stand back. And as you stand back, the next thing he tells them to do is to make sure that your heart and your attitude is right. Sometimes we take the blessings of God for granted, don't we? Yeah. Notice what he says to him there in verse number 5. Joshua said to the people, stand back at the same time. Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Consecrate. What does that word mean? It means get your life right, get your life clean. If you study that word out even more, watch. Joshua was saying, clean yourself up. That included, now remember there's three days here, right? That included for them washing their clothes. That including from them uh, for, for abstaining from sexual relations. That meant step back and get your eyes on God. Remember, remember how holy God is. Maybe in the church today, the modern church, we have lost our sense of awe at the holiness of God. God is holy. We don't approach him on our terms. We approach him on his terms. I love the 24th Psalm where the psalmist paints the picture of the pilgrimage, the journey up to the temple. And he asks the question, who, who will ascend to the hill of the Lord? The hill of the Lord represented the same thing that the Ark of the Covenant represented. And that is to be in the presence of God. To be in the presence of God in the temple. Who will ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who is even worthy to, to come into the courts? Who is even worthy to come into the temple and to be even close to? to the presence of God, the psalmist answers his own question. He that has clean hands and a pure heart. You see, we do not come to God 
and demand that he receive us on our terms. We come to God on his terms. That we are sinful. That we are broken. That we need to be clean. And that's why for us today that are blessed to be in the new covenant through the blood of Jesus Christ. That we are cleansed. That we are forgiven. That we are free because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, that he is our high priest making intercession before us, before the throne for us. And we have the wonderful invitation, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, to come boldly to the throne of grace. And there we find mercy and help in the time of need. But watch, church, watch, watch, watch. Oh, how many times in our lives do we cry out and do we come to him asking for his help only when we find ourselves in complexity let me illustrate it we're over here doing our own thing living our own life caught up in the things of this world things seem to be going okay then all of a sudden er, oh my goodness we've got a problem what are we going to do we need some help in this matter help god help Help, here I am. Now, I've been over here living in the world, loving the world, entangled with the world, my eyes on the world, but I'm over here, and, and, and God, now I need you to fix my complexity. And it's almost like you can hear from heaven God saying, now, where have you been? What have you been doing? Now, we know as his children, he welcomes us. He welcomes us. But, but I want to illustrate this in the scripture. I want to illustrate that with a story about the ark. Your homework assignment today is to read 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 3 through 11. The Philistines come up against Israel, and Israel loses. There's about 4,000 soldiers that are killed. So Israel's befuddled. Why did we lose? We lost. There's a problem here. What should we do? Oh, here's what we'll do. Hey, you guys, go over to Shiloh and get the Ark of the Covenant and bring it over here in the middle of the camp. That's going to fix this situation. If we get the Ark, the presence of God, if we get the Ark over here, man, we're going to win. We get God on our side, this is going to be good. We're going to win. We're going to drive them back. We're going to pay them back for what they did to us. That's exactly what they did. They brought the Ark into the camp. Now they're ready to go at it again. They take off against the Philistines, and it was worse this time than it was the first time. Not only that, the Bible says the Philistines captured the ark of the Lord. They took the ark with it, the presence of God taken by the enemy. I need to just say this to somebody today. Our God is a God of grace and mercy and love, but his call upon our life is not a call where he wants to be the spare tire in your world. He wants to be the God of our life. What does he want us to do? I don't know about you, but I get myself in some messes. Anybody relate to that? Can we like start a support group for that? We get ourselves in, in messes, and none of us are perfect, and we're all struggling, and we're all walking this road of life. And, and God knows our frailty. He knows our weakness, but he loves us anyway. But here's what I believe. I believe that our God in this complex world, in this complex life, that what our God wants is he wants a covenant people that love him. And we're not perfect, but we want to just do the next right thing. I remind you that the word says, be ye holy as I am holy. Consecrate yourself. The second thing I want you to see in this text is not only to do the next right thing, but I think in verses 7 through verse 13 that we all need that reminder in our complexity. Remember that God is always in control. God is always in control. 
Now, Christian, hear me today. God is not in heaven wringing his hands over America. I got like two amens on that. God is not in heaven today wringing his hands over Russia and Ukraine. I am, but he's not. God, God is not worried about how bad culture. He's not wringing his hands. What am I going to do? How am I going to respond? God is outside of time and space. He's sovereign. He's always in control. No matter how complex it gets, God is in control. And God is in our complexity. Notice in verse number 7, for the first time since Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, he actually speaks. He speaks to Joshua. Notice what he says to Joshua. Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Circle the word know in verse number four, circle it in verse number seven, and circle it in verse number 10. God wants them to know that he is God and he is in control. Now, now part of that is that he has placed his hand upon spiritual leadership. He's placed his hand upon Joshua. And he says, Joshua, I'm going to exalt you. I'm going to lift you up. And if you know anything about studying Joshua in his life, you know that Joshua is not on an ego trip. He is a humble, submissive servant of the Lord. I love Henry Blackaby who wrote Experience in God. He also wrote a book entitled, God called the leader Joshua. And in that book, he said this about Joshua. He said, if Joshua had reduced himself to demanding respect from the people, he wouldn't have deserved it in the first place. Joshua is not trying to point it to himself. He's not trying to say, hey, look at me. I'm, I'm large and in charge. No, he's pointing everything to God. God's faithfulness and our obedience. Notice God says, I'm going to show the people that I'm with you just like I was with Moses. Verse 8, and as for you, command the priest to bear the Ark of the Covenant. When you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Joshua said to the people of Israel, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. Notice Joshua does not point them to his own wisdom, his own knowledge, his own battle experience, the plan that he and his commanders have come up with. He points them to listen to the words of God. And here he is in verse 10. Joshua said, here is how you will know that the living God is among you. And that he will, without fail, drive out from before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, Jebusites. Now, you got to get that. It's kind of a little bit in order somewhat. The Jebusites are all the way over in Jerusalem. That's who occupied Jerusalem at this time. And Joshua said, here's how you're going to know that God is going to see us through every step of the way. He's going to validate his power and his blessings. What is Joshua doing, church? He's saying to the people something that I need to say to the Point Church today. This is the Lord's work. That's what Joshua's saying. So that you will know the living God is in this. That this is not about us, but this is about him. Point church, this church is not about me. This church is not about you. This church is about him. Who owns the work? He owns the work. God is in control. It's all about his name and his fame. It's not about Joshua's fame. It's not about Tim's fame. It's not about the name of the church out there on that sign. It's about his name. That his name would be glorified. Joshua is pointing it all to the name above all names. And he says to them, God said, the priest need to go step into the Jordan River and just stand there. Now I can just imagine, because I've been around Baptist people my whole life and I am one. 
that somebody must have said, that ain't going to work. Or maybe somebody said, that's about the dumbest thing I've ever heard. How, how, how is just standing in the water going to fix anything? But we learn from that, that we need to just do what God tells us to do. Isn't that hard to do sometimes? Isn't it hard to just do what God tells you to do when it doesn't make sense? Or when you're fearful? Or when you're the kind of person that lives your life wanting to be in control of everything? If I can just get my hands on it, I'll fix it. Or, you know, if I was in charge of it, I would get a committee together and Standing in the water would not be the first thing we would do. I love what Robert Morgan said. He said, put your foot down and land on a promise. <laughs> put your foot down and land on a promise. Because when we are moving in his direction the way God wants us to go, knowing that he's completely in control. And, and, and this series in Joshua is entitled what? God's faithfulness, our obedience. Will you say that with me? God's and our, one more time, God's and our obedience. Okay, so obedience is this. I'm going to take a step in obedience. I'm going to take a step in obedience. I'm going to take a step, and I'm going to land on the promises of God, knowing that God is completely in control. You're here today, and you're fearful. You've got anxiety. Oh, please. If I stopped right now and just begin to tell you stories that I know as a pastor in our church family, you would gasp. You want to talk about complexity? I said in the first service today, I said, what if we all, just the whole church, we all just told our issue, and then we made a top 25, and we decided who had the most complex issue? Whoever's number one would be saying, number 25 thinks he's got it bad. He ought to hear what I'm going through, right? I'm telling you, there's some complex issues. And God says to us today, in the complexity... I'm still God. I'm still in control. I'm still working my plan, even in the mess, even in the chaos. I am God. Joshua, you tell the people, I'm fixing to do something. The Jordan River's in front of them, but I'm fixing to do something. And when I get done, they are going to know that I am the true living God. And look, the Amorites and the Girgashites, the Jebusites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Hittites, that's a mouthful, they all have their own gods. They're all looking to their own deities. But what I want my people to do is to look to me because I am the true living God. Verse 11, 12, and 13 are just the instructions that Joshua gives them. Verse 13 says, When the soles of the feet of the priests bear in the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. You know what God is saying to his people? Watch this. And I think he's saying that to us today. He's saying that to some of us. You're paralyzed by fear. You're overwhelmed at your complexity. And God is saying, watch this. I'm about to work in a great way in your life if you'll just obey me and trust me. Let me finish. Verse 14 to 17. The third thing, the third lesson I see is not only do the next right thing and remember that God is always in control, but, but let me close by saying to all of us that we need to be willing to walk whatever path God has for you. Be willing. Be willing to walk whatever path God has for you. Look at verse 14. I'm going to read through 17. When the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with a priest, bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan, 
And the feet of the priests bearing the ark were dipped in the brink of the water. Notice that parentheses at the end of verse number 15. That is such an important parentheses in this moment. Your Bible says, Now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of the harvest. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarethan, and those flowing down toward the Sea of Ereba, the Salt Sea, that's the Dead Sea, were completely cut off. And the people passed over opposite Jericho. Now the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel was passing over on dry ground until the nation finished passing over the Jordan. Now, I want you to look at this map here for just a second. I love Israel. As a matter of fact, we're supposed to be in Israel right now. We were supposed to leave this past Monday. As a matter of fact, for those of you that would be interested in this, I looked at my phone in between the services there, and Israel announced that March the 1st, unvaccinated people can visit Israel again. So some of you will be glad to hear that. Some of you don't care because you have been vaccinated. Just a little news there. I love going to, to the nation of Israel. It just, it just makes the Bible come alive. And I want you just, if you could, for just a minute to see this story. So up here in the north is Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is uh, the, the main water supply. And my clicker here is not working right. Maybe it will in a minute. There we go. Mount Hermon is up here in the north. And so the nation of Israel, every year, they have to pray for a great winter. Okay, they need snow, not only for uh, the ski slopes uh, that they all enjoy going to, uh, both uh, Jordan and Israel and some of the countries around there, but, but Mount Hermon is the main water supply for the entire nation. So what they need is they need uh, the snow up here on Mount Hermon, they need it to melt, and then as it melts, it comes uh, on a slope. It mentions it there in the Bible. Uh, uh, water's flowing, verse 16, the water's coming down from above. And so the slope comes from Mount Hermon down. As that snow melts, it comes down into the Sea of Galilee. And then the Sea of Galilee opens up into the Jordan River. And the Jordan River runs all the way down uh, into the Dead Sea. Now your Bible says that this is the time of the year, the time of the harvest. When the Jordan River is overflowing in its banks. The Jordan Valley is such a beautiful place. If you've never been there, you'd love it. Uh, agriculturally speaking, there's a lot of green, luscious fruits and, and all kinds of things. Uh, in the Jordan Valley, uh, there's some spaces uh, three miles wide up to 14 miles wide that make up the valley. When you think about the, the Jordan River, some spots in the river is only about 200 yards wide, some uh, even up to a mile. And during the flood season, the water is coming from uh, Mount Hermon in a, in a white water rafting kind of way. The water is gushing. And on one hand, it's, it's very beautiful. It's a precious thing because the nation knows we've got a wonderful water supply. But you can only imagine that at this moment when you've got a million people that need to get through it and to the other side, it creates a real obstacle. Why is all of that important? I'll tell you why. Because God chose to do this not at an easy time when the water was low. <laughs> Are you tracking with me? God chose to do this at the most dangerous time, the most difficult time, when this would be a miracle that would be of epic holy cow proportions, that the people would be overwhelmed. And notice what the scripture says. It says that the water was backed up to Adam. Now here's Jericho. It says they crossed over at the area of Jericho, the city of, or the place of Adam is about 19 miles north of Jericho. That's where the water stopped. Now, lest you're a skeptic and you can say, well, there's just no way this could ever happen. We do know, historically, there have been six times where there has been an earthquake or a mudslide, 
and the Jordan River has actually been stopped. So we know that it has happened. We don't know if that's what God chose in this moment to use to pull off this miracle. But here's what we know. The Bible says that it happened, so we know it happened. That they walked across on dry ground. Think about getting nine, uh, a million people across the Jordan River. It's very likely that this took a day for everyone to get across. And, and I want you to write this down. Write this down if you're taking notes. The people of God did not sneak into the land. <laughs> they went in with fanfare, with one of the greatest miracles in the Bible. Can you imagine the Amorites, the, the, uh, the inhabitants of Jericho who are up on the wall and they're watching what's going on and they see the Jordan River stops running and they're going, I think he's done it again. And the people cross over, and, and they don't cross over in the mud. <laughs> they cross over on dry ground. And it just reminds me today to remind you to walk, and to remind myself, to walk whatever path God has for you and for me, and God will work it out. I'm going to close with an awesome quote from Del Ralph Davis, and I, I hope you'll digest this. It's not going to be on the screen, but I hope you'll digest this for just a minute about the mighty works of God. Here's what he said. The rescue at the Red Sea, the crossing of the Jordan River, and the death and resurrection of Christ are explosions of God's power that are meant to color the whole horizon of the believer's life in order to assure us that God, who so mightily handles all of the great emergencies, is surely adequate for the smaller crisis and anxieties that beset us. So the Jordan River crossing is to just put a little bit more color on the horizon of your Christian life. To remind you that God can do anything. And whatever you're going through in your life, whatever you're experiencing in your life, I remind you that nothing is too small for Him. And He cares. And I never, ever, ever want to minimize your complexity. Some of you got some, some serious things that I, I can't say. Hey, well, here's the answer. Here's the formula. Here's what you need to do, just like you don't have it. And God just sent us here today to just get a good reminder. No matter what you're going through, He is the God of complexity. I have struggled this week trying to find somebody that knows the hymn from 1945. All these young whippersnappers on the staff, none of them know. Even Brother Joe, Dr. Music McClellan. <laughs> Is there anybody in the room that knows the hymn from 1945 that goes like this? Got any rivers? you think are uncrossable. Got any mountains you cannot tunnel through. God specializes in things thought impossible. And He can do what? No other power can do. Anybody got any rivers that you think are uncrossable? God's saying to you, that's nothing for me. Can we pray together?